kind of an arrangement. One of the most recent cases on this in Iowa involved a situation where a mother was taking her bluebirds to camp and an accident took place. Suit was brought and they went to the Iowa Supreme Court. Uh, as I recall, the Iowa Supreme Court uh, did not uphold the verdict that the district court had. So in a carpool situation where there's a benefit conferred, it's a question whether the guest statute applies. Well, I didn't say I didn't say the guest wasn't responsible. I'm saying that it was not a question of the guest's injury. If the guest had sued for his injuries, that's what we're talking about here. Then the guest would have had a, had a very difficult time collecting. But that wasn't the point in that case. The case was the damage attributable to what the guest did. And the Iowa Code says that accidents uh, are the responsibility of the owner and the driver of the car and the damages that flow therefrom. And I presume here there probably was a determination that uh, the driver of the car could have rendered a greater degree of control over the, over the guest. I, well, uh, that's an interesting question. For business purposes. They're not a social guest then if it's business purposes. It's not a purely gratuitous go along for the ride type of thing. Where a benefit could be conferred immediately or immediately on the driver or the owner of the car. One of the cases in Iowa where they tried very hard was where children, two young fellows, were out looking for fender skirts. They were driving all around the countryside looking for fender skirts. Well, uh, they tried to argue that this was a benefit because they're going to get them for both cars, you see. Both the cars of the social guest as well as the owner of the car. So uh, there's an attempt to try to make it a non-guest situation. But if it's a business matter, it's generally not too difficult to make it a non-guest situation. Okay, the, the question here is a conflict of law question. This is rather complex, and conflict of laws uh, aren't always terribly clear, but there would have to be a determination made when an accident took place what law should be applied, whether you apply the law where the accident occurred or the law where the parties were residing. Now, the old rule was you applied the law where the accident occurred. More recently, there's been the development of a rule that that state may have the least interest in compensating the individuals, in which case if there was another state that had a more direct and complete interest, the court might apply the law of the other state. Okay. Well, uh, I think we probably should cover also the Good Samaritan Law before we break for coffee. Uh, then after coffee we'll talk about uh, manufacturer's liability. The problem of coming to the aid of someone in peril has long been a problem. And there's been no legal duty, no legal responsibility, maybe a moral one, but not a legal one, to come to the aid of someone in peril. If you're cruising down the road and you see someone going down for the third time in a pond, you're perfectly privileged to go right on past and wave as you go by. You're not under duty to stop and render aid to that person in peril. Now this has, of course, caused a great deal of, of controversy as to the duty on the part of citizens to come to the aid of people in peril, but there's been no legal duty to do so. In fact, there's been considerable legal discouragement to come to the aid of people in peril, because if you start rendering aid to someone in peril, then two things should be kept in mind. One, the hand once applied to the task cannot be withdrawn with impunity. That is to say, you cannot just stop rendering aid whenever you feel like it. You cannot stop until someone is there to take over the aid that you've been rendering. Two, if you render that aid negligently, you may be responsible. A rather classic case here involved a railroad accident in the 1930s. 
The Illinois Central was running a freight train across Illinois, cruising along one cold winter day, and a, an, an inebriated individual, I suppose in those days you might even call the individual a bum, was asleep on the track with his leg very carelessly dangling up over the rail. Well, the engineer didn't see the fellow until after it was too late, cut off his leg. Well, the train crew stopped, backed the train up away, went back to look the situation over. By that time, the guy had awaked, and <laughs> they decided that something should be done. Now, at, at, as the law existed in Illinois at that time, that fellow was a trespasser. And technically, I guess, there was no duty on their part to do anything for him. But they decided that really wasn't the best solution. So they concluded, well, we've got to get to go to a hospital. The nearest hospital was several miles back the other way. But that was not the direction the freight train was going. So they loaded the guy up on the freight train, took him a couple hundred yards down the track to a section house where the section crews would come on duty and leave. Well, as they got there, the section crew, one section crew, was just going off duty, or about to, and so they decided to wait until the new crew came on. Well, the new crew was late. But when the new crew arrived, they loaded the fellow up on a gandy dancer. It was a hand-operated section cars. Off they went with him back up to the hospital. But the total lapse time was about two hours, and the fellow was dead by the time they got him back to the hospital. The court held the railroad responsible because they had not rendered assistance carefully with out negligence. So that caused people great concern. Well, maybe I'll render aid and assistance and be rewarded for my efforts by being held liable. So that discouraged actively people from rendering aid. It didn't come up once a month. Remember, however, that if you're a driver involved in a motor vehicle accident, there's a statutory duty for you to stop and render aid. Don't forget that. That's a matter of statute. That's a matter of statute. Well, to get around this problem of trying of discouraging people to come to the aid of someone in peril, the Iowa legislature a few years back, just a few years ago, passed what is called the Good Samaritan Law. And several states have enacted this kind of legislation. Now, the Good Samaritan Laws provide that if you come to the aid of someone in an emergency or to someone who's involved in an accident, then your duty to them is much, much less. You can only be held responsible if what you do constitutes constitutes recklessness. Recklessness. Simple negligence isn't enough. So it tends to give a modicum of protection to the people who come to the aid of those in peril. Now this can be a two-edged sword. Ostensibly, the incentive was to try to pass legislation that would encourage people to come to the aid of others in peril. But the other side of the coin is that it may encourage people to come to the aid when it might not be in the person's best interest to have aid rendered to him. And after an automobile accident, someone decides the best thing is to take the guy out of the car and stretch him out of the ground. That might sever the spinal cord after uh, serious injuries had already been inflicted. And I suppose it'll be some time before we'll really know whether, on balance, the Good Samaritan-type legislation, which tends to remove liability, will be a net plus or not. I suspect that it will be a net plus. Was there a question? The Iowa Code uh, refers to this, at least appears to me, in terms of, the, of those who are involved in it. Not legally. You're under a duty if you're involved at all. And there is there is a, a well-developed concept that if you're asked to by a peace officer, there's certain prerogatives they have. What constitutes, constitutes aid? Actually, the rendering of any services or the uh, to a person in peril or an emergency situation offered on their behalf. Well, the Iowa Code spells out that you're supposed to stay at the scene of the accident, see that uh, uh, medical assistance is obtained, if necessary, transportation to a hospital, and so on. The Iowa Code spells that out. If you're interested during the coffee break, you may peruse that section I brought along the code so you can read it yourself if you have a particular interest.
It has long been a crime to trespass on posted property having a pool, pond, or water-filled pit if the posting is registered to the county sheriff. I suspect sometime a legislator had a problem with a gravel pit, and so a rather specific solution to that was obtained. It's also for a long time been a mis excuse me, misdemeanor to hunt with dog, bow and arrow, or gun upon the cultivated or enclosed lands containing an artificially constructed pond or ponds. So we've had those two criminal possibilities for misdemeanors. Well, now, the Iowa criminal trespass uh, law, which was passed last year, also makes it a crime, a public offense, I don't, I if one knowingly trespasses upon, or is upon, or remains upon, property of another. And that includes public property, too. So we now have a strengthened criminal trespass law by virtue of what the last session of the did. Notice, though, the recreational use of land at about mid-page. The General Assembly, a few years ago, as we alluded to earlier, provided that someone who owns land or occupies land should be encouraged to let others use it without charge. And if this is done, when you let someone use your property without charge for recreational purposes, there is no duty to keep the premises safe or even to warn people of dangers. Only are you liable for willful or malicious acts. And the last session of the legislature provided specifically some new categories for what you could permit without liability, including hunting, horseback riding, fishing, swimming, boating, camping, picnicking, hiking, pleasure driving, motorcycling, nature study, water skiing, snowmobiling, other summer and winter sports, and even viewing or enjoying historical, archaeological, scenic, or scientific sites. So that's a rather broad grant here of right so that a property owner or occupier can feel rather confident in letting other people use it without charge. But if they start charging for it, then of course that converts the people into invitees and you lose this protection. A couple of days ago in eastern Iowa, a fellow said, well, now I let people snowmobile on my property, but I put up a little tin can and I expect them to drop some money into it when they snowmobile there. Well, if that's the expectation, that may very well be removing them from the gratuitous uh, status, and if they are paying for it, then they are entitled to a higher duty of care. So that's a very important point. Well, <clears throat> we were about to discuss before we broke the matter of loaning property. What if you borrow property from another, do not pay for it? This isn't a matter of renting it from the rental, you just are borrowing somebody's property. And there's an injury. Problems? Only if the lender of the property knew of defects that he failed to point out to you. So if you loan a, an emery wheel, for example, or any other dangerous instrumentality, there's a duty to tell the borrower about hidden defects you know about that he isn't likely to find out about. But otherwise, there's no responsibility. However, if you charge for the use of the property, directly or indirectly, either through, through cash or through an exchange situation where you are loaning him or her something, then you're under duty not only to warn of hidden dangers, but also to search out defects, to conduct a systematic examination of the property. That is a duty. And if injury occurs and a reasonable inspection would have produced the defect, then you may be responsible. Manufacturer's liability is the next major area we'd like to cover. Now, the manufacturer's liability question has undergone a great change in the last 50 years. Up until the, shortly after the turn of the century in the United States, our handling of manufacturer's liability was largely governed by a series of cases typified by the old English case of Winterbottom against Wright. Now, in that old English case, Mr. Winterbottom was taking a leisurely trip from London to Liverpool. And on the way, riding in a stagecoach, the coach collapsed and he was grievously injured. Well, his first reaction, since it was a new stagecoach, was to sue the manufacturer of the stagecoach. Obviously, he could have sued the stage line because he had a contract with them and they were under duty to carry him safely. But he chose to sue the manufacturer. The court said, you cannot do that. 
because you had no contractual relationship with the manufacturer. Your remedy is with against those people with whom you had a contract, a contractual relationship. You didn't have privity of contract, it was called. Made it very, very difficult for a consumer to sue for negligently manufactured or negligently designed products. In 1914, Mr. McPherson bought a brand new Buick automobile, and on the first spin, took his new Buick out and got it up to 25 miles an hour, and one of the wheels collapsed. They're wooden spokes. He, the car turned over. He was grievously injured. So he brought a suit against Buick on the grounds that Buick had manufactured the spokes negligently. The New York Court of Appeals finally, deciding it in 1916, held that in, com in a reversal of the cases prior to that time, that if a manufacturer produces an item which, unless carefully manufactured, is reasonably likely to cause harm, then there is a duty of care imposed on the manufacturer to manufacture the item with care. And from that has grown a great body of law dealing with the negligence in design, negligence in manufacture type situation, permitting suit even though there's no privity of contract. You can sue the remote manufacturer. Now let me give you some examples chronologically dating from about the time or shortly after McPherson right up to the present time. One of the first cases after McPherson was against the Coca-Cola company in Atlanta. A person bought a bottle of Coke, drank the bottle of Coke, thought it tasted just a bit strange, set the Coke bottle down. There within the Coke bottle were the skeletal remains of a mouse. The process of the Coke sitting there had pretty much caused the rest of the mouse to be dissolved within the Coke. It was a greatly enriched Coke, and the person, after seeing the skeletal remains, was nauseated and <laughs> suffered grievous injury and sued and won. Another case against a Coke also, Coca-Cola Company, involved a case where the person drank his Coke, put it down, and there was the remains of a large cigar butt that had been left in the bottle, distilled out all of the impurities and all the other things that appear in cigar butts, again making the person quite ill, and he recovered. Another case involved a plug of chewing tobacco or a manufacturer of chewing tobacco. Now, not all of you here I know are even aware of what chewing tobacco is, but those of you who've been around a few years know that there is such a thing, a phenomenon of chewing, and it is a phenomenon, I, I tell you, of chewing tobacco. It comes in a plug wrapped in either cellophane or some kind of a covering. Well, this particular case, the person bought his plug of chewing tobacco, uncovered the end of it, and took a bite, masticated several times, looked down, and there was about one half of a well-decomposed human toe in the plug of chewing tobacco. Again, very, in, very ill. A little later than that, about two years later, another person bought a plug of chewing tobacco, bit into it, and there was the front half of a tobacco beetle. The rear half of the tobacco beetle, of course, had been pretty well <laughs> masticated. All these cases were won by the consumer on, these, on the ground that you can sue for negligence in manufacture. There have been many cases involving pieces of metal in food products, particularly meat, cases involving negligence in manufacture of serum, the famous Cutter vaccine case of the 1950s, and the Sioux Falls Serum Company case involving animal vaccines, more recently the suits against General Motors for ne alleged negligent design of the rear axle of the Corvair, and even a couple of cases involving alleged negligent placement of the gas tank on the Corvette. Well, I think we're just beginning to see uh, a great number of cases involving negligence in design. And I think we'll probably see more negligence of manufacture cases. Now we'll take a limited number of questions. I think because we have so much yet to go, we probably shouldn't take too much time. Yes? Poss possibly so, however, 
if the vehicle or the item is, a, is designed for general usage and it's reasonably anticipated that its usage will carry it into those hazardous situations, that may not be a complete defense. That may not even then be a complete defense. That is a question of fact. Well, the last clear chance doctrine is an interesting uh, piece of law because sometimes you are perfectly in the right. Perfectly in the right, you've observed the rules rather carefully, and the last clear chance doctrine says you're not privileged to absolutely insist on always having your own way. Now this particular doctrine is best understood perhaps with an example. Let's assume that you're cruising down the highway in a 10-ton Mack truck, and you know the traffic lights very well, you know the duration of them, you see one that is green up ahead, you know it's a very long light, and you have plenty of time to get through it, so you are cruising along at a normal rate of speed. You notice a little Volkswagen coming at right angles, approaching the intersection, and it's fairly clear at that point that he either hasn't seen the light or for some other reason is not going to respond there too. You're not privileged to just step on the gas and run over him, <laughs> even though the rights are all in your favor. If you have the last clear chance to avoid injury, you're supposed to take that last clear chance to try to avoid injuring someone else. Even though you are quite in accord with the law as it affects your status, you may be under a duty to use the last clear chance to avoid injury. This is known as the doctrine of discovered peril, sometimes applied to railroad engineers, that if they discover someone on the tracks, then they're under duty to try to stop. But if they don't discover them, well, that's just too bad. Some states call it the doctrine of discoverable peril and also call it the humanitarian doctrine. There the duty is to keep a lookout. It is a discoverable peril concept and if you were negligent in not keeping a lookout you may be responsible under the last clear chance doctrine as it's been extended. As we had noted earlier in Iowa, parents can be made responsible for the acts of their children, children under age 18, and are if the parents have legal custody of their children, but there's a limit. Only up to $1,000 liability for a single act, $2,000 to the same individual complaining for two or more acts. And even then, only for unlawful acts caused by the children. Now there are some kinds of activities that are so terribly dangerous that public policy has encouraged departure from the ordinary negligence principles. This class of risk we call strict liability. Strict liability. It means that because it's so terribly dangerous, society says you are free to go ahead and uh, actually carry on the activity. But if in the course of carrying it on, because it is so hazardous, injury results, you are responsible regardless of how carefully you may have done it. Strict liability. Negligence is not a question. Now some examples might be cited. One is the keeping of wild animals. Anytime you keep a wild animal, then you are under, generally, strict liability as to damages caused by that animal. Theory is, a wild animal is never fully domesticated, at least in the eyes of the law. So they may always revert to their wild way so that you are responsible no matter how carefully you may have kept the wild animal. The same thing used to be said, um, well, the, the, uh, let, let me go ahead and cover the second rule, then come back to dogs. If you keep a particularly vicious domestic animal, a bull or something of that nature, you know it's vicious, then you are responsible as soon as that vicious propensity is known to you then you become liable under the strict liability principle. Dogs formerly were treated under that rule, giving rise to the old idea that every dog was entitled to one bite. <laughs> then it was decided several years ago by the General Assembly that maybe that was too extreme, so the Iowa legislature now says that the owner or harborer of a dog is liable for even the first bite, unless the person who's complaining was committing an unlawful act. So this tends to treat the dog in a rather cavalier fashion. It tends to put the owner of the dog in a rather uh, important position so far as responsibility 
for the acts of the animal are concerned. A third example of the strict liability is the use of blasting materials. Dynamite, anything of blasting nature, whether you're using it to clean out a, a ditch or to blast out stumps, this is hazardous enough that if you do it, you are responsible for damages caused. Another is the impounding of water in an unnatural way behind a dam. The dam breaks, bursts, people downstairs are injured or drown, then you are generally responsible under strict liability. A few states say that the use, the application of chemicals from the air, particularly the particularly toxic kinds of chemicals, may fall under the strict liability rule. Very, very few states have done this, but some states have. At this point, I'd ask if you have a question. There was one up here. Might very well, could very well be. To run the fairground? Okay, uh, the people who run the fair or the, uh, the racetrack might be too. At this point, we should cover the concept of employee employer or employer employee versus independent contractor. Now, these are two extremely important relationships. If the relationship existing between two individuals is that of employer-employee, then the employer is responsible for all of the damages caused by the employee, all the injuries perpetrated by the employee, while the employee was acting within the scope and course of his employment. Now if the employee was off on a frolic of his own, that doesn't make the employer responsible. But if the employee is doing what he was basically under a duty to, to do, to perform, then the employer is responsible. It makes the boss liable. If, however, the relationship is that of independent contractor, then, generally speaking, the person hiring an independent contractor would not be responsible for the acts of the independent contractor. Now, let's take a couple of examples. Let's assume that you hire someone to paint your house, and you call them up and you arrange for it to be done. They're going to use their ladders, they're going to do it when they want to do it, in a manner, with the number of people they want. Uh, that would probably be an independent contractor relationship. Then if they cause injury or they cause damage, that is not your concern, because that's an independent contractor relationship. However, if you hire someone, say someone junior high, high school boy by the hour to do various jobs, including the painting of your house, you've retained control over the manner and means of performance. So the way he does it, the time he does it, the tools, the instrumentalities he uses, all are under your general control. Then you are responsible for everything he does and all the injuries caused. So it's very important when you enter into a relationship with someone to make it rather clear whether you are creating an employer-employee responsibility or an independent contractor relationship. Yes? He would generally be liable. Now you may be also, as the, as the owner, because of negligence on your part too, but the independent contractor would be responsible here. Now let me point out, and the reason for raising this in the first place is, that, there are, that the activities that are dangerous, inherently dangerous, do not permit you to avoid liability by hiring an independent contractor. If you want to blast out a ditch out through your back lawn, so that you get a bit better drainage, you can't avoid liability by hiring someone to come in and do it. If it's inherently dangerous, the person hiring the independent contractor remains just as liable as if it had been done by an employee. But that's reserved for the inherently dangerous kind of activity. Okay? Anything else on this 
strict liability business. Again, we say as a general proposition, you're not under duty to, to be a guarantor of people's continued good health. But the strict liability rule brings it very close to you being a guarantor of their continued good health, where the risk is, is, is very great. The hazard is substantial. Well, even if you were a trespasser, there's a question whether you've committed an unlawful act you still probably can complain about the bite of the dog. That's why you really need to be careful about dogs. And again, the question almost always comes up, but what if I have a sign up that says danger, bad dog? Well, that's not going to count for much. Signs, exculpatory signs like that, don't really count for much. You also see the sign that says not responsible in case of accidents. You see these in uh, auction places, for example. You cannot declare away your liability so easily as to put up a sign declaring you're not liable. You can get a release. A release is a contractual undertaking in which the parties agree that one will not sue the other one. A release may follow an automobile accident. A surgeon may ask for a release before surgery. But merely putting up a sign saying not responsible is not a release. You see these in dry cleaning establishments sometimes, not responsible for damage or loss of, of, of garments. Obviously, if there's negligence proven, anyone who's in business to the people who are doing business, the invitees, will be responsible, yes. Well, there's a question of how far you can go in, in broad scale releases, but there's considerable latitude in doing that. If it's done, entered into knowingly, I've agreed, it's part of the bargain, ostensibly the rental or the payment or the benefits will reflect the quantum of risk that I'm shouldering, you see. Then the courts have tended to go along. If the parties are copus mentis, mentally capable, uh, and, and all that, you see. The next section has to do of our discussion has to do with the employer's liability for injuries to employees. This is a rather major concern these days. We'll first go through rather quickly the, the rules that existed for many, many years. Then we will move to the workman's compensation scheme, which applies rather broadly today. It doesn't apply to every employment, but it applies to most. Now, under the old rule, that applied everywhere before the turn of the century. An employer was responsible for injuries suffered by his employees if he was negligent. That was a matter of breach of his duty to the employees. Now we're going to list here five common duties owed to employees. The first duty was the duty of providing reasonably safe tools and equipment. You're not supposed to send an employee out with defective or unsafe equipment. The last case to reach the Iowa Supreme Court involved a dull axe. A fellow sent an employee out to cut a tree with a dull axe. The district court upheld an award for the injured employee when the axe slipped and he cut his foot. But the Supreme Court reversed it on one of the defenses we'll look at in a moment. The second one is you're supposed to provide a reasonably safe place where people are to work. It's a common law duty. The third, if you know of dangers they don't know about, you're supposed to tell them of those hidden dangers. Fourthly, you're supposed to provide reasonably competent fellow employees. As we'll see in a moment, if you are exercising reasonable care in the selection of your employees, then you are not responsible if one employee injures another employee. But if you tend to hire the, the, the town deadbeat uh, to do something, and in the process another employee is injured, you might possibly be responsible, you see. But if you exercise care, in the selection of fellow employees, then you'd not be responsible if one injures another. Fifth, if the work you're doing is the kind that could be hazardous, you're under duty to make reasonable rules for how it's carried out. If you're dealing with chemicals, this might be a duty to maintain rules for protective clothing or for ways in which dangerous chemicals are handled, the use of grinding wheels with protective glasses, uh, acetylene welders, that type thing. 
there is a duty to maintain and enforce the rules uh, that would be relevant to carrying on the activity. Now, under the old common law, however, the employer who was liable because, or who has been held negligent by virtue of breach of one or more of those conditions, still had some defenses. He could defend on the ground that the employee had assumed the risk. Now, the employee might have assumed the ordinary and inherent risks of the occupation. When you go to work for someone who deals in dangerous chemicals, you're assuming the ordinary inherent risks. I suppose maybe if you work for the Atomic Energy Commission, you might be assuming some ordinary inherent risks of super radiation. I don't know, but that type of a risk could be considered ordinary inherent, I suppose. Also, the employee is deemed to assume those risks that he can see, understand, and fathom, and in the face of them goes right ahead and carries on activity anyway. So the employee may even assume those risks. Second defense is if uh, the employer has is if the injury was caused by negligence of a fellow employee, a good potent defense. The third defense, contributory negligence by the complaining employee. Well, this was the old common law system, and this is the way for hundreds of years that injured employees were compensated. But it became apparent during the latter part of the 19th century that this wasn't a very acceptable method for compensating injured employees. It left many employees uncompensated because they could not prove negligence on the part of the employer, or the employer's defenses were forceful enough to deny recovery. And so about the turn of the century, state by state, the legislatures passed workmen's compensation laws. And now every state has a workman's compensation system for dealing with uh, the problem of injury suffered by employees. Now the workman's compensation system uh, is important to us because first of all there are some exemptions. Secondly, it's of interest to us because this basically is a no-fault system. We're in the middle of discussion about no-fault automobile insurance. That is not the first time we've dealt with a no-fault concept. Workman's compensation, since about the turn of the century, has been a no-fault method of compensating injured employees. Many of the same arguments made today against no-fault automobile insurance were made then about uh, no-fault employee recovery, known now as workman's compensation. Under workman's compensation, an injured employee need prove only two things. One, he was injured or suffered from an illness related to the occupation. Two, that that illness or injury was incurred or contracted while the employee was acting within the scope and course of his employment. Those are the only necessary elements of proof. Fault is totally immaterial. It matters not whether the employer was at fault, the employee was at fault. The idea is that certain numbers of injuries are likely to occur, and the cost of doing business in a particular occupational area ought to include the costs of compensating those people whose lives get chewed up or who are, whose arms and legs are lost in the process of producing a commodity. The theory being that the cost ought to be moved to the consumer of the product. That whoever consumes automobiles by buying them and driving them ought to pay enough so that it compensates the people who lose in the production process without fault. So we've had this system now uh, for, in some cases, more than 70 years. There are some, e some exemptions, and each state is a little different. So far, workman's compensation is a state-by-state -state matter. There is legislation now in the Congress that would make either make the state workman's compensation laws uniform or take over workman's compensation and make it a federal proposition. At the present time, the exemptions under Iowa's workman's compensation law include household or domestic employees. If you have someone coming around doing some work a few hours a week, around the home, those would not be covered by workman's compensation. And so they would be back on the old common law system that we've been talking about. Second, people whose, of, whose employment is of a casual nature. The person you hire just a few hours now and then, not with a regular systematic pattern. Thirdly, persons engaged in agricultural pursuits are excluded, but since about 1959, they have been permitted to elect to be covered under workman's compensation. Now, the Workman's Compensation Act is compulsory for state employees. 
it is compulsory for all employees of the state, for counties, for school districts, for municipalities. There they have no choice. For other employers, it's presumed that workman's compensation is applicable. That's the presumption. Except that the employer may reject workman's compensation if he cares to. The employer could file a notice and reject workman's compensation, in which case he loses his three basic defenses, which puts the employer then at the tender mercies of an employee who wants to sue. Remember this, that the recovery under workman's compensation is specified by statute in great and gruesome detail. If you lose a, a thumb, you get so many dollars. If you lose your little figure, you get so many dollars. If you lose a leg, you get so many dollars. If you lose your life, you get so many dollars. Spelled out in the Iowa Code, exactly how much you get. It's an easy recovery, but you cannot sue for more. The injured employee is barred from suing the employer, whether there's negligence or not. So the employer then is trading the uncertainty of a possible suit for a constant annual cost, because generally speaking, the employer funds his workman's compensation liability with a policy of insurance that based on, is based on payroll costs, so many dollars per hundred dollars of payroll, depending upon your risk classification. And that cost would normally run from about a dollar per hundred dollars of payroll for the very low risk occupations up to maybe three or four dollars per hundred dollars of payroll for the high risk operations. The three most risky occupational areas in terms of illnesses and death are first, the mining or extractive industries, second, construction, and third, agriculture. Those are the three most hazardous. Yes, the military has its own. decide he doesn't like this nonsense. He may decide he'd rather take his chances in court. After all, if he has a big loss, he might be able to recover a million dollars, or at least a half million, and he may want to take his chances in court. And he could reject workman's compensation if he does so before the accident or illness uh, actually is contracted or incurred, is incurred as the case may be. Okay, any questions about workman's compensation that you would like to raise at this particular point? Yes. Well, this is a question of whether this is reasonably within the scope in terms of employment. Now, uh, I'm trying to recall if there have been any recent cases on the overnight stay. Uh, you may possibly be where your presence there is dictated by the nature of your employment. You really don't have an option to return home, in which case you're remaining really on the job or with the employment. Unless it has become systematic, like construction in another city, where uh, the employer considers you off duty at five o'clock and, and you just simply have an apartment there or something of that nature. Yeah, probably so if you're uh, still acting basically within the requirements of the job. Okay, now I'd like to mention something else. Uh, this is the system that exists, and if, you, if your employees are covered workman's comp, then you should be concerned about that system. If your employees are not covered, if they're exempt from workman's comp, then of course you're back on the common law system. But there's a new, there's a new bit of legislation. Have all of you heard of the williams Steiger? Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. Is there anyone here who has not, who has employees? You should all have heard about the Williams-Steiger Act of 1970 because it affects every, every employer who has one or more employees. Now, the uh, new act is administered by two federal agencies, the Secretary of Labor, Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare. Two federal agencies are involved. It's basically federal legislation the Iowa Department of Labor does have some involvement in it. Now, one of the reasons why 
this act uh, has been uh, passed has been the high rate of employee illness and injury, deaths, in certain occupations in particular. Notice that mining has 1% of the employees, 4% of the work deaths, four times as many work deaths, twice the injuries would be proportionate for 100 per 100,000 workers. Construction is next, 72 deaths per 100,000 workers. Agriculture is third with 67 and so on back. So there's a real effort here to do something about that particular act. Now, who's covered by the Occupational Safety and Health Act? Every employer is covered. Every employer. If you have one or more employees or if you trade effort as between firms, you're still covered. Federal, state, and local government employees are excluded, but there's a provision for them to be brought in later, and they probably will be. Now, what are the obligations of an employer? There are two essential categories of obligations. One is to comply with the standards for your occupational group, and those are being announced now. They're developing standards for each kind of activity. Uh, they're developing and announcing these standards from day to day. The second is you're under duty to keep records. You're under duty to keep certain records about accidents, injuries on your premises. Anything more than a mere band-aid kind of an accident, you're to log in, on a log kept in your premises, then you report any lost time accidents, and if there's a death involved, you not only have to report it, you have to report it within 48 hours directly to the regional office by telegraph or mail, or by telephone. You should have received, those of you who have employees, a little booklet entitled Record Keeping Requirements for the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Now, that particular little booklet, a rather innocuous looking thing, has a centerfold. Now, some of you are familiar with centerfolds. Well, now this centerfold is about as important as any centerfold you'll find. This particular centerfold is a notice. It's to be taken out of this little book. Just take it out, take the staples loose, take it out. This notice is to be posted where your employees can see it, in a prominent place. And I just learned yesterday that failure to post this, one of the uh, inspectors says, is going to draw an immediate $1,000 fine if it isn't there. There are pretty stiff penalties, and so just not posting this notice is starting you off on the wrong foot. So we'd suggest that if you don't have one of these, by all means obtain one of these little booklets, get the centerfold and get it posted. Also, the next page or pages will be the log. It's in there too. And then you log all the injuries. Then there are report forms for reporting injuries to either the state or the federal government. And I do have a few copies of a, of a more detailed outline about the act that you might like to look at. Okay, our time is fleeting. Uh, the penalties can go $1,000, uh, even $10,000 if the violation is willful, and they can be doubled if you're for a second conviction. So it's a pretty serious act, and we'll want to be following it and I think following it with a good attitude in terms of the fact that it is basically designed to provide a more safe environment for employee. Well, the remainder of our discussion, and the time has come for my lease to expire, but the rest of the discussion had to do largely with matters that pertain more to the agricultural setting than to the urban. Those of you who are here as people from farming may very well want to have a look at those would normally conduct this type of an activity as an all-day workshop. We have about four and a half hours and we can go into all these sorts of things. Tonight we have skipped over some, summarized others, to acquaint you with some of the ideas that we felt might be worthwhile to you. Since I promised you that I would expire, my lease would expire at 9.30 and it's already 9.34, I will not keep you longer. If you'd like to remain for a time and ask questions, just so you ask them in a general way, uh, I'll be happy to stay behind for a time. Thank you very much. You've been an absolutely great group.